With the will of Allah Jalla wa ala and by His grace we will continue with our journey through the stories of the Prophets. And subhanAllah these stories of the Prophets are incredible and especially when it is about our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And last time we had a look at the Ismatul Anbiya or the infallibility of the Prophets and we said that Prophets without any doubt don't commit any sins and especially and certainly not kufr and certainly nothing which a true genuine believer wouldn't do. So when we look at Abasa wa Tawalla, barakallahu fikum, then very often the, our comprehension of the story is that the Prophet ﷺ made a mistake. That's how we look at it. Like he made a mistake, a blind man came running to him looking for guidance and the Prophet ﷺ was addressing the people of grand status from Quraysh uh, of an elevated status and rank from Quraysh. So he turned his back to the blind man uh, because he was what uh, he was actually irritated. So this is the way that we understand it or that they try to uh, make it seem, but that's not true. One of the reasons why it can't be true is because, because this story or the way it is portrayed would not even describe the true mu'min today. A true mu'min wouldn't be like that. So how about the Prophet sallallahu Like turning your back and frowning and like, who do you think you are? Don't you see that I'm occupied? And why would he be frowning anyway? The man was a blind man. So this would be closer to outward gossip and showing that you are yani, annoyed by someone who can't really see your facial expressions. So how can this be attributed to the Prophet So the first thing we need to know, Barakallahu Fikum, that whenever we describe a Prophet, or whenever we talk about a Prophet, then we never ever ever describe them with something which does not suit them as Prophets. The Prophet was sent as an example. Allah said, In tahtadu. If you follow him, you will be guided. So how can I follow him here? Because he was corrected by the Prophet, by Allah Jalla wa Ala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ أَنِ نَقِرَاءَ إِسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ." There is a good example for you in the Prophet, the Messenger, yani of Allah. So we have to follow his example. So now, what is Abasa wa Tawalla, wa tawalla all about? So that's the first thing we need to know. So I'm going to ask you, Khayyam, every time, or you, if you like. Uh, to say the words out loud in English, which we have there. عَبَسَ وَتَوَلَّى أَنْ جَاءَهُ الْأَعْمَى وَمَا يُدَرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّى أَوْ يَذَّكَّرُ فَتَنْفَعَهُ الذِّكْرَى Read that one, please. The Prophet frowned and turned away because there came to him the blind man interrupting. But what would you perceive, O Muhammad, that perhaps he might be purified? Allah, Allah, Allah. He reminded with, and the remembrance would benefit him. Mm. So the first thing here, they translate an as because. But an can be translated in so many different ways. Now he frowned and turned away because. But an can also mean he frowned and turned away when. Meaning that it was at the same time that the blind, blind man arrived, the Prophet turned away from him, not knowing that he was coming to him. And he was frowning because the people of Quraysh, they were listening to him and they didn't accept his message. So when you listen to someone, you frown. So this can be a possible explanation, even if this one is a bit far-fetched, it's still possible. And for me, a far-fetched explanation, defending the honor and status and outward actions of my Prophet, are more beloved to me than going to that which is not as far-fetched, and may indicate in a certain way that the Prophet ﷺ was wrong in something. You see? But far-fetched doesn't mean impossible. No? It doesn't mean impossible, right? So this is my approach. And this, I'm, there may be many people not agreeing with me here. And they would really say, he frowned, turned away, because a, prophet, because a blind man came, and he was annoyed, like, don't you see that I'm addressing other people? You shouldn't be interrupting me. No? But this is for me not rahmatan lil alameen. So Abasa wa Tawalla, 
So here, Barakallahu Fikum, Abasa wa Tawalla, he frowned and turned away نعم, when the blind man came to him. So some might even indicate here that he turned away when the blind man came, but he didn't know he was the blind man. The person was still far away, and the Prophet ﷺ knew that whenever people would see him, they would stop him and talk to him. And he was now indulged in something which was very important. So he yani, looked, frowned like, oh, there's somebody coming, so I better start talking. You see? That's another possible explanation. Are you with me? Like the Prophet saw him looking, and there's somebody coming, and he knows when someone comes to him that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, will have to address him. Because that is the way that... He, so he quickly turned away before the other person was in the perimeter... Per, per, Perimeter, we say it like that, where you actually give salam to someone. So, okay, I better start talking now. So that's another thing. Another thing which is possible, barakallahu fikum, yani, abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma wa ma yudarika la'allahu yazzaka. So here, abasa wa tawalla, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, and this is the story which the most people will tell you, is he frowned and then he turned away. Now when the blind man came to him. And then Allah says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَى what, what does that say there? It's the third verse. But what will make you perceive that perhaps he might be purified? Continue. Or be reminded that remembrance would benefit him. Yes, continue. As for he who thinks himself without need to Naam. give attention. Naam. And then? فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى How is it translated here? No, I want verse number six. Or to give you, uh, to him you give attention. Hmm, ajib. You know, a sad, a sad and yasudda, yani, is that you block someone. Naam? Yasuddu an sabili. Naam, they, they place an obstacle on the way of Allah Jalla wa Ala. So, let us now go back and I want to try to, uh, I, I want to, try to explain the, the story. So if we were to say that the Prophet ﷺ really turned away, then he would still have been correct. Why? Because he was already speaking to a group of people. And it's not the adab to come and interrupt the Prophet ﷺ when he was talking. So now, Barakallahu Fikum, why then is Allah Jalla wa Ala not, but apparently it seems like, but which isn't, Yani criticizing the Prophet ﷺ. Why is he blaming him in a certain way? Well, definitely not because of what he has done. Because what he did was correct. If we were to say that the outward story is, I'm talking to a large amount of people, you come, you interrupt me. That's not a nice thing to do, isn't it? So then I will just frown and I turn away. Frowning is educating in a very brief way. Like if somebody would be talking here and I would just frown, you would stop, right? Imagine, Ibrahim, which you never do, by the way, but you would be talking to, during my class, and I would just go like, that is like, this is not good. What you are doing is wrong. It's not like uh, I am saying anything else. And after that, I can still teach you, Habibi, when I'm talking, please listen carefully. Don't interrupt me. So, but at that time, the Prophet ﷺ didn't have that time. So he would just go like, like, don't, but the problem now is here, the blind man can't see. So why would he then frown? So was it just his fa facial expression, like, which is a normal, natural thing to do? He's like, like, doesn't he hear the voices? And in himself. Now the thing is, Allah Jalla wa ala is saying this, meaning that the Prophet Sallallahu was not seen when he did it. The only one who saw it was Allah. Are you, are you with me? So the frowning here would not be a form of gossip. Because, وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَةٍ الْلَمَّازِ الْغَمَّازِ Yani is the, also the one who gossips with his facial expressions or his eyes. Like for example, uh, I would be uh, entering into the room, Ibrahim, sorry I'm taking you as an example today, right? Uh, but you're not Ibrahim, you are Abdul Hakim, why don't you correct me? So, uh, so if, if I were to enter into the room, Ibrahim, and you would go like this, like that. What, what's that? Look, look. Now, it's a kind of gossip. 
Like, or you roll your eyes when nobody sees you. Like someone says, MashaAllah, and I prayed my Fajr on time today. And you go like, like that. What did I say? Yeah, yeah. So all of this is gossiping. So facial expressions and even frowning might be considered to be gossip, especially if the person can't see you. Ah. So we know that the Prophet ﷺ didn't frown towards the blind man. Rather, Abasawa, the wow here is not in order. He first frowned and then turned away. He did both at once. So he didn't frown towards the blind man. He just went like this, like, what's going on? And that was it. Do you understand? So this is why it is important that we look at the yeah, the wow. I don't know how it's translated again. Abasa wa tawalla. And turned away. Okay. So that, that could be understood like that. Yani he did two, the same, the same, and, uh, yeah, the two at the same time. So Abasa wa tawalla. Yani when the blind man came to him. Now they say because the blind man came to him. So the frowning and the turning away was because of the blind man. Now, it, it, it is rather he frowned and turned away when the blind man came. Now, because, and then Allah says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَكَى So once again, Allah is talking about ilmul الْغَيْبِ What do I mean? Outwardly, the Prophet ﷺ was doing what was correct. Like one, he was already talking to the masses, yani to the leaders of Quraysh. Two, the blind man had already believed. Ibn Umm Maktoum. And the, what, the, 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 the leaders of Quraysh, they didn't. And the Prophet ﷺ said, let me give priority to whom? To those who have not yet believed over the one who has already believed. But this is why Allah says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّى yani When we go back, what does it say? وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ Ah, so Allah is saying, yes, this is correct what you are doing. But what could have made you know, because you were not informed by me, that the blind man would be guided even more if you would have addressed him, while the other party which you are addressing, the majority of them will never believe. They will remain the people of Quraysh who will kill you. So Allah says, it's actually very gentle. What could have made you know, Ya Muhammad? You didn't know. So it's not like Allah is describing Abbas wa Tawalla. He's not rebuking. He is not criticizing. He's just mentioning what is happening. And then he's telling us why it is happening. It is happening because he has no knowledge of the unseen unless that which Allah shares with him. لَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِي السُّوءُ Says Allah Jalla wa'ala that Muhammad ﷺ had to say, if I were to know what the unseen and so forth. So he only knows from the unseen what Allah lets him know. So now to come back, Abbas wa Tawalla is a description of something. It is a description of something which is correct. I turn away and I frown, not to rebuke the person because the situation is very strange. And I talk to the people whom I want to guide, the other one has been guided already. And what I'm doing is correct. But Allah now says, look, your ijtihad was correct. But you don't base yourself on ilm al-ghayb. And if you would have given priority to the a'ma, it was, yani, sorry, and if you have given priority to the others, it's just because you didn't have knowledge of al-ghayb. Does that make sense? I'm making like very complicated. In my head it sounds so simple, and I'm just making it more and more difficult. Does somebody understand what I'm saying? You don't. Others do? Okay, I'm going to forget everything which I said. Okay? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala sayyidina Muhammad. Okay, so look, we have Abbas wa Tawalla, so Allah Jalla wa'ala is describing what the Prophet ﷺ is doing. He's talking to the, to the leaders of Quraysh. A blind man comes for information. He doesn't give attention to the blind man, but rather to the leaders of Quraysh. Why? Because he was already talking to them, and two, because they didn't believe yet, and the other had already believed, so he could wait. Outwardly correct. Do we agree? But because there is a certain kind of vibe which might be considered negative of the Prophet ﷺ frowning and turning away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now defending his Prophet. And he's saying, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَكَّى 
Yani you turned away from the blind man because what could have made you know that the blind man would have been guided even more? And that that which you would have said him, told him, instead of turning away from them, would have purified him. But the ones who think that they are not in need of Allah, you address them, you talk to them. Now, why? Once again, because you, you didn't know. Does that make sense? But what do we take away from this barakal of fikum? Like sometimes the, they say that the Prophet ﷺ was addressing the leaders of Quraysh because he said if they are guided, their people will be guided. Um, if they are guided, the peop their people will be guided. And this is why very often people hope that, once, uh, that a singer or a movie star or a sports, sportsman or women become a Muslim. They say, if Michael Jackson would become a Muslim, so many people would become Muslim. That's not true. When uh, Cat Stevens embraced Islam, which is use of Islam today, people started burning his records. Like when he became a Muslim, the majority didn't say, wow, let us go for Islam. The majority felt betrayed. My mother lived back in the days. She said people were piling up his records, were breaking it and burning it and cursing him because they felt betrayed, because he was changing their spiritual power flower lives. You see? So it is not because someone is guided that the rest will be guided. It was the case with Umar radiallahu anhu. Now when he, well, yani he embraced Islam, people didn't start embracing Islam, but the Muslims were protected. But they didn't become a Muslim thanks to Hamza, who was uh, the lion hunter, as they say. Why do they call him lion hunter? A knife and he would attack lions. Now, he, he, he would just fight lions. We can't even imagine that. So people were afraid. So they didn't become Muslim because of that, but rather they left Muhammad alone. When Umar, who was very known and strong, became a Muslim, nobody became Muslim. So it was not because of these important people, if we go back in the days, at the very beginning, that other people would become a Muslim. So this is wrong when you think like this. And it is something which Allah Jalla wa is teaching him. He's teaching him, yani, the, through the revelation, that the weak believers are better than the strong disbelievers. And that this, eventually this Ibn Umm Maktoum became one of the people who would what? Who would not only call to prayer, but would also sometimes lead prayer when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallama would leave what? Would leave for battle or anything else. So now Allah Jalla wa ala is telling us like, don't look at numbers. It's not about quantity in Islam. It's about quality. If it had to do with quality, the entire world or quantity, the entire world now would have embraced Islam. We are the biggest faith group ever. Can you imagine? One billion seven hundred million. Can you imagine? But it didn't change the world, did it? Because it is not about quantity. And this is what it is telling here. If you would have addressed the blind man who had already believed, would, this would have been better. But you didn't know because you don't know al ghaib So what you did outwardly was correct. So I'm telling you what I know in al ghaib and I'm sharing this with you. So this is why like the Prophet ﷺ said, and in the end of days, you will be many, as many as, what do you call which is on the sea? The foam. As much as the foam on the sea. It, it is worthless, right? It is just, it disappears. And they, he will say, that day, you will, yani, you will be conquered. They said, Amin qillatina nahnu yawma idh, ya Rasulallah. He said, will we be conquered because we are so small in number, ya Rasulallah? He said, la. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ كَثِيرٌ كَغُثَاءِ السَّيْلِ Nam, so he was referring to rain and others he was referring to the foam on the sea, the ocean. He said, you are many, as many as the raindrops. And then he said, but there will be wahan in your hearts. And they said, what is an wahan, ya Rasulallah? قَالَ حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةُ الْمَوْتِ They said, and what is an wahan, ya Rasulallah? He said, love, excessive love for dunya and hatred for the hereafter, uh, for, the, for death, and that you will be hating death. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, عَذَابُ أُمَّتِي فِي دُنْيَاهَا Naam, and this is sound of hadith, in the Mu'jam of Imam Tabarani, rahmatullah alayhi. Yani, the azab, the punishment of my ummah is in her love for the dunya. Is in her love for the dunya. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, in the end of days, you will be many. 
but it will be of no benefit. Because of what? Because of the hearts. If you imagine, let us go back to Uhud. So it's all about numbers here, and this, this is why I'm connecting it to that, right? So when we go back to Uhud, what happened? Can you tell me why the Muslims lost the battle? They won yani in, in the hereafter, but why did they lose outwardly? The archers left their post. The archers left their post. No? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes what happened, he says that the majority of Muslims lost because of the wrongdoings of the minority. Some of you want the dunya. And that was just in this particular instance where these people, these archers, they saw that the spoils of war were being divided and they said, we will lose out on our share. So they run thinking that the war was finished. Because what? Because yani, uh, the, 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 the spoils of war be, were being divided and that only happens when what? When the war is finished. But the Prophet ﷺ knew the tactics of Khalid ibn walid Sayfullah later on. And he saw that they were positioned in a very strange, yani on a, in a very strange way, which would allow them to get to the archers. And the archers were on a mountain overseeing everything. They were not indulged in the center of war, allowing them to see things clearly. And, and what shooting. So now the Prophet ﷺ said, remain there until I give you the order or permission to come down. So they did ijtihad. And this is one of the adilla that whenever there is a sunnah, you don't do ijtihad. Whenever there is a clear cut sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, you're not going to philosophize. And this is one of the things. They did ijtihad while the Amrun Nabawi, while the command of the Prophet ﷺ was there. And that's very dangerous. The Prophet ﷺ saw someone eating with his left. He said, Kul bi yaminik. He said, eat with your right. He said, I can't. But he said it out of arrogance. And he said, la stata'at. You will never be able to do again. And his hand was paralyzed. So, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ fitna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Watch out those who go against his sunnah to what? Of a fitna. And Imam Shafi'i said, Fitna is shirk. And of a painful yani, punishment. So because they went against the sunnah, with ijtihad, punishment came down upon him. And this is why the mujtahid, whenever he does ijtihad, he needs to be sure that, is, that there is not a straightforward hadith about the issue. Because if he does ijtihad, while well, there is a clear cut, straightforward hadith, he should be yani, cautious not to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, these people came back. Allah jalla wa ala, yani, he speaks very well of the Sahaba. So all of them had brotherhood. All of them, all of them loved one another. All of them were ready to give their lives for the Prophet sallallahu All of them would pray at night. All of them would fast. All of them. They were the exemplary community. But Allah said, because some of you, some, of you love the dunya, this is the reason why you lost. Now we, we don't have the characteristics of the Sahaba, we don't have this mutual love, we, we might not be wanting to give our lives for the Prophet ﷺ, and so much more, we have all these diseases, and the majority amongst Muslims love dunya, so how are we ever going to win? So it is not about quantity, it is about quality. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, when there are 12,000 genuine believers, if they lose, it will not be because of their numbers. 12,000 mu'mineen are sufficient to transform the world. Where are they? You know, the, 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 Allah Mustaan, if you have 12,000 people who are genuine, true believers, then the ummah is saved. And this is why uh, when Mahdi will come, we are always passionately looking forward to Mahdi, but also passively. Mahdi will only come when the Ummah is walking on the Sirat al Mustaqim. Mahdi will not come to save us, Mahdi will come to honor us. It's a very big difference. The Mahdi will come when the Muslims are strong, when the Muslims yani, live their deen, when the Muslims are purified, because only the best of Muslims that day will be at his side. So he will not come to save an ummah who is destroying itself with hubb dunya with hasad, with bold. 
jealousy, gossip, speaking about Allah without knowledge, preferring money over hasanat, and crying over money more than they cry over their sayyat. He will not come for these kind of people. He will not. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the situation of people until they first change their own situation. So if we want the ummah to be blessed, then we as even individuals should work on our own selves so that we can be one of these 12,000 people through whom Allah and by whom Allah Jalla wa will save this ummah. And this is why, one of the reasons why you want to purify yourself is yes, to save you from hell, to please Allah, but to save the ummah. Um, so every sujood you do, every ruku might be saving someone on the other side of the planet. Um, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said we are like one body. When, when you, a toothache is one of the worst things. Um, when, when you have a true toothache, you can't do anything anymore. Um, and it stops you from sleeping, it might stop you from concentrating in your prayer, even from communicating with your family. Why? Because of one single small nerve being touched by heat or cold. That's it. Something that you can't see with the naked eye, nothing. Where is it? I don't see it, but it's there. And because of that small thing, your body is in pain. Maybe the people in Palestine, maybe the people in Syria, maybe the people in Iraq, maybe people in so many different places around the world are suffering because of us. Because we don't protect the ummah by trying to be as good as we can. Because we are one body. Because if we are going to look at them and us, you will see that their iman is usually far stronger than ours. I gave the example many times of these people losing everything but still praising Allah for what they have. If he loses one hand, he says, Alhamdulillah, I have the other. If we in the morning wake up and there are no eggs or there is no bread, the entire house will hear it. Subhanallah, once again, Last time I told you to wake up and to go to the shop and this and that. So we are complaining about bread and eggs. And they are praising because Allah let them keep one hand. Some would say, like Ibn Ajiba mentioned in Iqad al-Himam, there was a man and he was happy the day his son died. And the day his, what? his cattle was stolen. And the day his house was ruined by the enemy three times. And he said, how, how can you still be smiling? He said, Allah took one child away from me. So I have one to mourn over, but others to be happy with. It's one. He said, two, as for my cattle, he said, now it's their responsibility. I will not be asked anymore, any longer about how I treated them. Until today, until today, I treated them well. But I don't know how I would have treated them tomorrow. He said, and about my house. He said, why would I grieve over a house in this life when he has given me castles in the next? And this is what made our Muslims so strong. Without knowing it, we have started loving deeply this dunya. We love the dunya. And we, we need to fight that. Loving dunya doesn't mean that you can't be dressed nicely. Prophet was dressed nicely all, to, all the time. It is what's happening here in your heart. Um, and this is why, uh, to come back, the dunya was not created to take you away from Allah. She is nothing but a mount which you can use to drive towards Allah. Um, she was created... Yes, to test you. And being tested takes you to Allah. So she was not created to what to, to what to harm you. It is the way that you use her that will harm you. And this is why Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah was a rich man. But he never used the money for himself. You know, all, I, I have a book in Dutch again about the ten companions who were promised paradise. And I went on a journey looking for their common demeanor. What did they have in common? Because there must be a reason why these ten were mentioned all together in one breath. There, must, there has to be a reason. 
So I went and then I divided their characteristics into that which they share and that which was unique for each one of them. Right? So I, I wrote that book. And you, one of the things I found is, apart from being pleased with the decree of Allah and not narrating a lot of hadith, but practicing Islam more than talking about Islam, was their love for the akhirah and not for the dunya. It was ajeeb. And they had a lot of money. Uthman was richer than Jeff Bezos today. Now, if you think 150, now he made more money, 150 billion is a lot. Uthman had more. He had so much money. SubhanAllah. And then, if you look at them, they, a lot of them were rich, but they were giving everything away. When they came to Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, who was the governor back in the days under the authority of Umar ibn Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, Umar visited him. And because people falsely accused him of stealing money of the Muslims. It's always like that. The better you are, the more shaitan will use the, pe the jealous people against you who will slander and gossip and dis dishonor you so not, and humiliate you. So he came to Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah and he said, Abu Ubaidah, I know, I know you are not as they told me you are, but I need to verify because everybody can be changed by the dunya. Ya Abu Ubaidah. Look at Umar. Not giving the benefit of the doubt. So, and then they, when uh, he looked at the, 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 the house of Abu Ubaidah, who was the governor, and who was receiving money monthly, it was like a very small hut. And then he opened the door, and when he opened the door, he didn't see anything. He just saw a blanket on the floor, a jug to perform wudu with, and a sword and a shield. He said, Abu Ubaidah, do you live here? He said, yes, but I am moving. And he said, but why didn't you keep your stuff until you move? He said, because my landlord didn't tell me when I had to move. Allah. My landlord didn't tell me when I need to move from this house to the other. And then Umar understood. He said, is this what you have? He said, no. This is what he allows me to use. I don't, I don't possess anything. And he said, do you have something to eat? He said, yes. He said, where's your food? And then... You know, the corner of a blanket. He opened it and there were like small pieces of hardened bread. And he said, this is enough to keep me alive. And then Omar looked at him and he said, what is that blanket? He said, I sleep on it or I rest on it during the day. I pray on it during the night and I ride on it during jihad. And then Omar radiallahu anhu yani put, put it over his horse. And then Umar radiallahu anhu left his house. And he said, Wallahi ya Aba Ubaidah. Dunya has transformed all of us. Apart from you. And then Umar went, went away weeping. And this is when Ibn Abi Dunya rahimahullah azawajal mentioned in his book Al-Mutamannin. Yani the wishers. They, the Sahaba were wishing. All of them. I want this, I want that. And then Umar was thinking deeply. And they said, what do you wish ya Umar? He said, I wish a house filled with people like Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. Hmm. I wish a house filled with people like Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. He's the same one who was crying because he forgot a hadith. He was crying. He said, why? Why are you crying? He said, one day the Prophet told me something, Ya Umar, and I forgot. He was weeping because of forgetting a hadith. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose these people. And... So barakallahu fikum to come back because I went very far away but we come back again is this the beginning here is telling us it's not about quantity. If it was about quantity then the Sahaba would have been killed at the very beginning of Islam. What was stopping these people by the way to kill all of them? Allah. Allah. When the Prophet sallallahu was riding his camel and the camel stopped the people said your camel is stubborn. He said no. The one that stopped my camel from going on is the same one who stopped the, the elephants of Abraha yani to demolish the Kaaba. So this is the way we look at these things. So barakallahu fikum, think about quality. Think about quality. The Prophet said, The most beloved deeds by Allah are those who are ongoing Deeds that which are performed with continuity, even if they are small in number. 
And shaitan always comes to us like he wants to seduce us to do as much as we can. And then you think this can't possibly be, possibly be from shaitan because I want to fast a lot. No, don't give me that story of three days a month. Give me the one of Monday and Thursday and the three days. Don't give me that story of just two raka'at during the night. Give me a story of 13 raka'at every night. And then you think like, yes. And then he injects this fake impression that now because you think like that, that you are like that. This is the impression. When we read books about deen or we talk about deen or we have these good intentions, it's like we feel that we are already competing with these people. Uh -huh. الشيطان سوّل لهم وأملا لهم says Allah in Surah Muhammad. يعني the shaytan made them believe and he dictated them to say these things. So and this is why, and the Prophet sallallahu said this deen is strong, and whomever wants to compete with this deen will be broken by the deen. The deen will destroy him. أكل متنطعون he said, the extremists and here not referring to ISIS, but rather to people who go to the extremes in religion, meaning doing more than they are asked or required to do. They are destroying themselves, he said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this is why instead of dreaming of all these extra things to do, beautify the small amount of things you are already doing. I mean, why are you longing for long night prayers if your fard is not the most beautiful moment in your life? Doesn't make sense. You complain during Ramadan, but you feel special when you fast on Monday. <laughs> Subhanallah. During Ramadan, oh, it's long. Especially men, very often towards their wives. Wives never complain. Usually they don't complain. It's very, very bizarre. Like during Ramadan, it's hot and this and that, and you don't hear them say, oh, it's too long, oh, I'm tired, oh, I have a headache. You don't hear. Usually it are the men. When they come back from their jobs, they jump onto the sofa and they zap away time on their television to forget that they are fasting. And then they say, oh, I'm hungry, oh, I'm tired, oh, I'm this. So you complain during the month of Ramadan and then you feel special when you do the Salm on Arafah. Start with quality before quantity. Not meaning that you shouldn't be doing these things, but at least improve your fard. Improve that which is obligatory upon you. No? Some people, they want to, I don't know, they want to learn, study rather, these different Islamic sciences, but they didn't study the three which are incumbent upon them and obligatory, which is fiqh, which is aqidah, and which is tazkiyah. Yani, also referred to sometimes as tasawuf. These three are what are Mandatory, they're obligatory. obligatory. So now they want, to, they want to study Naho, they want to study Usul al-Fiqh, they want to do all of this, but when you ask them about the names of Allah, they don't know. You ask them what is the, 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 the meaning of Al-Muhaymin, they don't know. So this is why, Barakallahu Fikum, it's all about quantity. And this is why sometimes Mashaykh cry. Because they give classes to hundreds of people, but maybe only one student will make the difference. And they say, where did the other students go? That's like Sheikh Suhail, when I was talking to him yesterday, and after my khutbah, we went and he, he visited me. Uh, we were talking for a long time, and he was sharing beautiful things with me. And one of the things he said is, الأصل هو, الأصل Meaning the asl, the basic ruling, is that someone doesn't give birth. And the exception is that someone gives birth. And Allah is giving us all the exceptions. Do you see that? Like, it is not normal. It is a miracle that someone carries a baby. That's a miracle every time over and over again. So the miracle is the exception, but he is pouring down his exceptions over us. And then he said, and that will be the same with you. <laughs> it was all about me. He said, you will have a lot of students. And the asal is that not all of your students will pass on your knowledge. But maybe one or two will make that difference. No. So abasa wa tawalla, normal, normal thing. That is not the blame, nor is it criticizing. It is describing. Is the difference clear? So this is not blaming nor criticizing. It is just describing what is going on. Nothing more. 
You turned away when the blind man came to you, nothing wrong. Because you were addressing a large amount of people, nothing wrong. The blind man had a what? A lack of adab at that particular moment, nothing wrong. But if you were to have known the unseen, then you would have turned to the blind man. Because in my knowledge, I know that he will believe and the majority of those who you are talking to will not. That's the only thing which is going on in the story. Now, the, the, I could have said everything just with these last two, three sentences that I've mentioned. Now it became clear, isn't it? So no blame, no critique, nothing wrong. It's actually the Prophet ﷺ uh, yani being defended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we would understand Abbas in a wrong way. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam.